group of people here that understand the importance of serving, the importance of serving in the church, and the importance of serving our community. Um, and so I was just asking the Lord, you know, what, what is up? Why do you want me to share this today? And I feel like it's kind of a reminder to you and I, there are times that we need to focus on what duties God has given us as Christian people, what our responsibilities are in the world around us, maybe to remind us that we need to focus on the things that we can change and not spend all of our time focusing on things that we cannot change and worrying and fretting about those things. We do everything that we can do and we need to focus on what God has called us to do as Christian people. So if you have your Bible there, I'm going to begin with uh, John chapter 13. And this really is probably one of my favorite stories um, just an understanding about serving. And I'm going to speak on this today a little bit and give you a unique perspective of this. But let's read this together. John chapter 13, and beginning in verse 1. Jesus is with his disciples. This is after all the events leading up to uh, the day that he, before he gets betrayed, goes to the cross. This is the upper room. This is... Um, the Passover and all this is going on and so he begins to teach and share those things that are important with his disciples and this is one of those things and it says now before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father having loved his own who were in the world he loved them to the end during supper when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot Simon's son to betray him Jesus knowing that the father had given him all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God he rose from supper he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel tied it around his waist then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except his feet, but it is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, he said Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put down his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you not understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also are to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever receives the one who sends me, and whoever receives me, receives me, receives the one who sent me. Now look over in Philippians. We're going to read Philippians chapter 2, one of the probably most known passive scripture that talks about how Jesus models this life, this heart of a servant in the Apostle Paul's book to the Philippians in chapter 2. And beginning in verse 1, it says this, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy 
by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, through, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What can we learn from these passages of Scripture that we can apply to our lives today? What can we take from these passages of Scripture, Jesus' story with his disciples 2,000 years ago, that we can apply to our lives today that will change the world the way it changed the world then. Well, some of the things that I want to share with us today are just to give you highlights of what I feel um, is very unique and significant about this attitude that Jesus had in this example of serving. One is to understand this. Serving is not powerless. It is powerful. It is powerful. And we didn't misspell the word powerful um, because we didn't know how it spelled. We did this because I want you to see that serving is powerful. It is full of power. See, if serving was powerless, why did Jesus spend so much time teaching about it and modeling it? Jesus is saying, if you want to lead in the kingdom of God, grab a towel. Because that's the way it works in his kingdom. See, today we are living in a power-crazed world. Everyone wants power over everyone else. Our elections over the past few years have proven that. Somewhere along the line, the idea of public service has taken a wrong turn. It went from service to serve us. Well, but that's for another day. It's another day. You know, a funny thing is um, that I've noticed, and being a pastor, I notice this a lot, that there are a lot of leaders, leadership conferences. A lot of leadership conferences. Seems like everybody has a leadership conference, and I think maybe they're having a leadership conference because the other person had a leadership conference, and if they don't have a leadership conference, then they're just not as important as the other people that are having this leadership conference, so they're going to have a leadership conference. Everybody is trying to lead somebody. Everybody's leadership conference. Why is that? Well, because I believe there is always a subtle, simmering lust in the human soul for power. No matter who you are, no matter what age you are, we see this lust for power in our relationship, in our jobs, in our world, in our families. It's a constant thing that we struggle against. You can see it in two kindergartners in a kindergarten classroom. That there is a struggle for power. Have you ever noticed that we have leadership conferences but we don't have serving conferences? We don't have following conferences or following seminars. The reason that there are no serving conferences or serving or following seminars is because if you put out on the sign serving conference, following conference, no one will come. See, everyone wants to lead. But if everyone is leading, then who's going to be following? 
See, power, power is seductive. Power is a trap. And when you fight and push your way for power, there's only one way that you can keep it. But when God gives you power, no one can take it from you because he's the one that gave it to you. See, we see this principle in the Bible. There's a constant debate even right now in this country for power. Does this man have power over the woman? Or does the woman have power over the man? Does the woman have power over her own body? Or does the state and the people have power? Does the state have power over your kids? Do the parents have power over their children? Or does the state have power? Who has power to teach your kids? Or does mom and dad have power? Does the state have power over the church? Does the church have power over the state? Power. Who has the power? See, that's the question. Who has the power? What causes this lust for power? What causes divisions and fights and quarrels among us? The Bible tells us it's the lust for power. It's the lust for for control in James chapter 4 and beginning in verse 1 it says what causes he says what causes quarrels what causes fights among you isn't it is it is it not this that your passions are at war within you you desire and do not have so you murder you covet and cannot obtain you fight and quarrel you do not have because you don't ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. So you can spend whatever you get on your own passions. Oh, I say, so you can get what you want and, you, and use your power. People want power. See, there's a fight over power and control. Right now, everybody is power crazy. I don't know about you, but it's just ridiculous. You can't turn on the radio, the TV, anything where somebody is just not crazy about power. The reason why Jesus modeled this idea of serving, because the lust for power didn't start with humanity. The lust for power started with Satan. It started long before you and I Wherever here, the Bible tells us that before Satan fell, his name was Lucifer. And he was the worship leader of heaven. He was the most powerful archangel or archangel, however you want to say it, in heaven. He was second only to God himself. But that wasn't enough for him. He wanted more power. Isn't that interesting? That even in us as human beings... No matter how much power we have, we can always get a little more. No matter how much money we have, we can always take a little bit more. See, it never ends. That's the idea of what happens with lust and power because it's never fulfilled. Satan understood that. He is the father of that. In Isaiah chapter 14, the prophet he tells us and gives us a little bit of insight to why Satan got cast out of heaven, why this event occurred. In Isaiah chapter 14, and verse 12 through 14, it says this. It says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's a reference to I'm going to be above every angel that there is already created. I'm going to have control over all of that. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the Most High. I will I will, I will, I will, I will. The lust 
for power started with Satan. Now, how do we combat that? See, how do we combat the human weakness, the human element inside of us for this lust for power? How do we combat that? The Bible tells us how we do that. You know, it's interesting that Satan, when he was going through this power, these I wills, instead of it taking him up, took him down. Instead of this attitude getting him where he wanted to go, it actually took him the opposite direction. See, any time we think we deserve to go up, you go down. Something unique about that principle. And the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 18, Jesus gives the story of the, this parable of two men, one supposedly righteous and the other one a sinner. And he says what the end result is of both of these when he says in Luke 18, 14, he says, I tell you, this man, he's talking about the man that went in and beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I'm, I don't deserve your kindness he said this man went down to his house justified rather than the other says for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted see this isn't a reference to you and I having more power Jesus is not feeding the human ego in this text this is a reference for us if we want to get to heaven that you got to humble yourself if you want to have a deep relationship with God it involves humility it involves understanding who has the power and it's not you when we humility what is humility is laying down your power your so called power see humility is the life for a Christian we get ourselves into trouble when we are not humble. I don't know about you, but that's usually where it happens with me. The only power I want, and the only power that a Christian, a believer should have, is the power over the devil and the power over themselves. Not power over anybody else. An interesting thing is, is when we submit ourselves to God, God gives us power over the devil, and He gives us power over over ourselves see true power only comes to us when we submit to following God and his ways in his words anything outside of that we lose our power we lose it even though we think we have it we actually don't we've lost it we lose our power over the devil and we lose our power over ourselves and why this is why I believe listen we can change the world by humbly serving one person at a time I've always believed that but it isn't just worldly serving. It isn't just taking on that statement and, and, you know, doing all of these things. No, it's got to have the heart of what Jesus is talking about here. This is hard. This is actually hard to teach what I'm trying to help us understand. Because nobody glamorizes serving. But they do glamorize being served. We glamorize being served. But Jesus glamorized serving to his disciples. It was hard for them. It was hard for them to see Jesus, who they considered and knew was the Messiah, to put a towel around himself and wash their feet. That was difficult for them to see because in their world, like ours, it's always being on the receiving end and not the giving end. In their mind, being a servant meant to be subservient. That means that person that was serving had less value than the person who was being served. Because that's the way they saw things in their world. 
Why? Because, think about it, they remembered Egypt. They remembered this idea of slavery being subservient. They were living at that current time under Roman rule. They were being subservient to the Romans. They wanted Jesus to be this conquering king to get them out from under the power. There's that word again. The power of Roman rule. They even had these discussions, as you read in the New Testament, in the Gospels, these discussions. They're walking down the road and having a discussion who's going to be sitting on the right hand and on the left hand when Jesus sets up his kingdom. See, they saw it only from a natural perspective. They just knew Jesus was going to kick some hiney. And, and they were going to be in ruling power with him. But he was actually showing them in his actions of serving how to break the power of darkness in the world. How to really have power. See, in their minds, to be a servant was to be weak. Was to be weak. And the reason they thought that was because they were still slaves in their mind and in their spirit. They were not sons and daughters of God. See, when you become a son or a daughter of God, like we said, it changes your perspective. But when you're a child of God, think about it. When you're a child of God... You are coming from a place of power and a place of strength, no longer weakness. There's a big difference to being served than to being subservient. It's a completely different attitude. See, you don't serve because you're weak. You don't serve because you're unintelligent. You don't serve because it's not cool. You don't serve because you're not spiritual. Jesus didn't serve. Think about it. Jesus didn't serve because, or wash feet because he was subservient or weak. He did it because he was strong. Most of us, that whole idea goes right over our head. See, Jesus gave us a model that it takes strength to serve. See, it takes strength. The question is, we could go back in these verses and look and preach a whole message just on the idea of Jesus laying his garments aside. What do you need to lay aside to serve? Is it your time? Your talent? Are you too talented to serve? Is it your treasure? Is it What is it that we need to lay aside in order to serve, Jesus even ad- was addressing that with them when he took off his clothes and put on a towel, laid his garments aside, anything that was considered of worth, he laid it all aside for the value of serving. See, it takes strength to serve in God's kingdom. It takes strength to be weak in God's kingdom. See, think about that. That. That idea goes completely against anything that we think about. Because we think it takes strength to be weak. What in the world? Are you losing your mind? Yes, I am, actually. Thank God. Because that's what we all need to do. And understand it from the perspective of who Jesus is. See, those who serve others are not inferior, but they're superior in the kingdom of God. When you're born again, you're born to serve. You're saved to serve. That's what we do. We're saved to serve. We're not saved to be served. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. I came to serve. Serving doesn't save you or earn you special privileges to get you into heaven, but it is the result of of what happens inside of us. Our motivations change. When our spirit gets born again, we have a different motivation. It doesn't act the way the world acts. It doesn't do what the world does. See, when you know who you are, 
you can serve without feeling like you're subservient or you're inferior. People don't need to say, well, I'll serve because there's really nothing else I can do because I can't really lead. Well, see, that's a wrong concept. That's wrong. You can wash feet without feeling like you're weaker than the person that you are serving. It's hard for us. I remember one time many, many years ago. This was, I don't even know how many years. um, Probably 20, 20 years probably, I'm sure, probably 20 years ago. I'd gone to, Jerry and I went to this conference in, in, uh, Colorado Springs it was a pastor's conference that focused on the family and this guy that was preaching there teaching the pastor he said I got an assignment for you he said when you get back he said this is what you need to do with your family he said you need to get them and wash all of their feet and he said stop being the big you and go back and show them who Jesus really is well, that Sunday I did. And let me tell you something. That was the, one of the hardest things that I had ever done. But I sat up, my kids sat up here. Those of you who were here, I don't know if anybody remembers that. It was a long, long time ago. And you know what's interesting about that? I look back at that event, and God reminded me about that event. And he says, look at your kids. He goes, they're all servants. They all serve. They have an idea and understand the value of that. That's what we love about our kids here, our school. The idea of our school is to raise up godly servant leaders to help them understand the power that there is in being that. It's not weakness. It's not a shame. It's what gives us honor. God honors those. See, one is spiritual the way we think. The other is physical. It takes strength to be weak you have to be strong look you have to be strong to be submissive Jesus had to be strong to choose to be weak when he's on the cross and the very people he created are cursing him and spitting at him and calling him names and saying if you really are the son of God then get yourself down from there save yourself Save yourself. Jesus had to be strong to be weak. It's the greatest thing to be strong. James tells us that that it's hard. You have to be strong to be submissive. In James 4, 7 it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submission takes strength. The Bible tells us to submit to one another. All of us, if we love each other, we submit to one another. There's a great reward for you when you see this in the right way, when we understand this in the right way. I like in John chapter 13 and verse 17, um, we've read that, but we read it in the ESV, and I like the King James Version. Most of the other, the other versions, and they're not wrong when they say, he said, you will be blessed if you do what I'm telling you. In other words, if you have this attitude and you serve and you, you know, do what I'm giving you an example of, he goes, you'll be blessed. How many of you guys want to be blessed? Well, that's, that's, the, that's the blessing in the kingdom. That's how we get blessed in the kingdom is through this attitude of serving. But I like the way the King James says it because it says, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Happy. Look at your neighbor and say happy. Happy are you if you do this. See, some people say, oh, we shouldn't use the word happy. We shouldn't use the word happy because the word happy comes from the root word hap, and that means that something has to happen in a natural way for you to be happy, and we should use the word joy instead. Oh, shut up. Jesus used the word happy and give me a break because I want to be happy right now. I want to be happy. How many of you just want to be happy sometimes? We want to be happy. Well, Jesus used the word happy because he understood that there are times we want to be happy. And you know what? We can be happy when we serve. 
There's something that happens in us. There's happiness that rises up in us in a natural, even a natural sense when we serve others. Maybe that's why there are so many unhappy people today. They need to understand this attitude. See, I kind of like, I kind of like the uh, idea back in Martin Luther's day. I'm reading this book, this uh, biography of Martin Luther that tells the, the true story. And I'll fill you in one of these days. It, it's amazing. It's pretty cool. A lot of research done in this to really find out what the truth was about Martin Luther. And, and really was an amazing, amazing guy. But, but the thing was back in his day, if you wanted to be considered great, then you shaved the top of your head. They made a little shaved cap on top of your head because they had longer hair and they just shaved this top right here. So everybody, these people walked around with the shaved top. They, they all knew, well, this person's trying to get himself to be humble and become great in the world. So as I look around this room, there are a lot of you that are on your way to getting there. So you're close. You're getting close. <laughs> yeah. John the Baptist had it right when he said, I must decrease so that Jesus can increase. That's serving. That's leadership in the kingdom of God. Serving can and does change the world when it's done in the way that Jesus modeled it. Lastly, this morning, I just want you to think about that's why it's one of the steps in our discipleship process that we have. It's not third because it's lower of importance or lower in priority. It just happens to be the end result of what happens when you love God first and then you love one another and you connect with other people. You want to serve them because you love them because that's what Jesus did You know, I heard a statement one time, serve your way to the top. Serve your way up. And I understand the idea, and I'm not critical of the idea. I understand the concept of that. But if that's your reason for serving, then you've missed the heart of Jesus. You've missed the entire heart of Jesus because in God's kingdom, serving is the top. Serving is the top. And he blesses those who have the right heart in it. And does something happen to you if you have the right heart in that? Does God keep moving you? Yes, but you never see yourself there. You always see yourself. Jesus said that the greatest among you shall be your servant. Matthew 23 in verse 11 says the greatest among you shall be your servant. You know, that's interesting. It's kind of a two-part thing. He's saying that number one, he's talking about himself, kind of in a third person. He's saying the greatest among you will be your servant. He's saying that's who I am. But at the same time, he's saying if you want to be like me, then this is what will happen. And what happens is, is when Christ comes into you, this is what happens. We see ourselves in light of Jesus. That becomes our identity. We see value in other people. We don't look at ourselves as weak. We don't see ourselves serving as a point of weakness. We see it as a point of of strength. See, there's no higher place in the kingdom of God that you can go than to be a servant like Jesus. And you know what I love? The devil hates that attitude. He hates that attitude. When we and our whole idea of power is released into the hands of Jesus. Why? Because the Bible says he's the great shepherd. He's the great shepherd. We're not. He is. See, the devil has no power over you when we have this heart of being a servant and realize that our strength comes from God. See, here's the question, and I'll leave you with this question. You know, I don't know what God will speak to you today. Maybe there are areas even in this church that some of you need to jump in and get involved in. I don't know. I don't know what your gifting is and your talent, your treasure maybe you need to serve you know because everybody i've found that everybody needs to have some act of service in the church and we need to find an avenue outside the church we need to serve the body of christ because jesus did that that's the whole point of washing feet whose feet was he washing 
It was his disciples, his friends, his family. He was washing their feet, loving on them, but he also went out and served his community, and he loved the people there. We need to have either one of, you know, both of those, some here and some there. So I don't know, maybe God is speaking to you in that. I don't know. But I do know this. Here's the question. I'll leave you with this. The question is this. Are you strong enough to be weak? Are you strong enough to serve? See, when we see that serving truly is leading, then the world will be saved and the whole earth will be filled with the glory of God. That will change the world. We don't need to fight for power because if God wants you to have it, He'll give it to you. And the wonder is, when He gives it to you, nobody can take that from you. And it becomes a blessing and not a curse. So let's pray this morning. Father, we thank You for giving us insight into how You do things. We thank You, Father, and we put our trust in You that as we serve in the love of Jesus Christ and in the heart of Jesus for our world and our communities, that you will change the community, the glory of God will manifest. You said that it would when we do this with the right heart and the right attitude. We put our trust in you. We thank you for just the opportunity to serve you. To be a servant of Jesus is no greater desire in human life than to be a servant of Jesus to the world. We thank you for this today. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget, if you still want to be involved in gathering a turkey or bringing a, a, a frozen turkey, we will be here this during this week, except Monday. You can drop it off, and we'll run it down there to Rio Vista. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. So great to see you today. God bless you.